hi, my name is Candy Castleberry Singleton, and I am the VP of Diversity Partnership Strategy and Engagement at Twitter. I am excited to uh, be a board member, uh, the newest one, uh, board member of Girls in Tech. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some thoughts that I have regarding diversity and AI. Uh, next slide. First, I think it might be helpful for me to put AI and, and, and describe it from the lens of which uh, I think of AI. Uh, AI is about the ability uh, of a computer or a machine to learn and think. Uh, every diversity conversation should include AI. I think for as long as I've been doing diversity and inclusion uh, for nearly 15 years now, uh, I would say that uh, we have evolved our conversation over the years from the traditional work of HR, expanded it in many cases into marketing. Uh, you'll hear a lot about diversity in procurement and philanthropy. And in recent days, you'll even hear it uh, expressed in the way that we think about policies on platforms. Uh, you can follow that information every day. What I can tell you that I don't hear enough of, at least in the space of diversity and inclusion in a traditional sense in workplaces where uh, humans are being replaced by technology and that technology is being programmed by humans who oftentimes may have the very bias that we have tried to address in workplaces. Uh, my uh, hope is that uh, not just from this conversation today, but also in uh, the hearts and minds of every human that we're thinking about diversity as a part of every AI conversation and every AI conversation should also include an element of diversity. From the lens of today, I think about AI from uh, how does it work? Um, how is artificial intelligence uh, being used to mimic human intelligence? Uh, how computers learn and respond to certain uh, actions? Um, and quite frankly, the use of algorithms and historical data, which often do not include uh, diverse data sets. Next slide. From an overall perspective, if you think about diversity uh, and AI, it literally is sits in the intersection of workplace and culture uh, and diversity sits at the intersection, it should sit at the intersection of artificial intelligence. So when, if, if, if we are to create a future that addresses diversity uh, in many ways that have not been yet addressed today that we're still working on often in workplaces, if we're not thinking about that parallel work of the workplace and culture and in artificial intelligence, quite frankly, artificial intelligence will outpace everything that actually we have made uh, accomplish in uh, areas that we've made accomplishments in as, as far as the workforce. If you think about it this way, and this image is uh, intended to uh, illustrate this, that trying to drive diversity through workplace and culture is literally like getting on one of these little uh, cars and literally trying to push diversity at the slowest pace possible. And for many of you, uh, you should know that I've been doing this for 15 years. There's generations who've done this work before me uh, in workplaces. And clearly, when you think about what's happening in America today and around the world, the context of uh, diversity, racism, uh, and all kinds of isms um, are still a part of everyday work culture. Uh, and we're finally, I think, at a place where we're willing to at least talk about it, um, where, where there is uh, an opportunity to get better as an organization, I think there also is a better opportunity, is an opportunity for us to think about how to get better in the way that we build systems and the tools that ultimately either are used by humans or will replace humans in the workplace. The, the opportunity that we have is that for the same amount of effort that has gotten us where we are in work and culture today, if we could just put that effort into artificial intelligence, we could literally accelerate uh, our ability to change the context of diversity and inclusion, not just in products, but as I said before, in HR, in the way that we market, in the way that we sell products to people every day, in the way that we think about the distribution of anything that we are doing where we're using an algorithm to produce an outcome. And the reason I use this uh, picture uh, as an example is because in the same way that I think that artificial intelligence can accelerate diversity, it can also create harm. 
in the absence of diversity in artificial intelligence, rec recognizing how at the pace of which artificial intelligence is replacing humans and replacing human tasks, if we aren't addressing that today, by the time we actually think about it being important, the train will have left the station and many people will have been impacted by the decisions that algorithms have produced. Next slide. So the world is run by, I'm just gonna try to break this into sort of just the basics, right? So um, as an experienced uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility sort of IDA, uh, IDEA practitioner, trained uh, at Berkeley uh, in Pascal, C++, probably before many uh, have even thought about technology. I just think about just in my lifetime and in my career, how quickly things have changed related to machine learning and accelerated, I mean, in artificial learning. I mean, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. The world is run by people and machines. So if you think about the fact that there is not a time, at least right now, where there is only people or only machines. So we do have to figure out ways to be more collaborative and not just the, th the ways that we think about doing diversity in the way that we interact with people, but we also have to be more collaborative in the way that we interact with those who program uh, machines. So on the next slide, you see just uh, an image of all kinds of people, plus these robots being all kinds of machines. And this is the way that we must begin to think about diversity. I think for a long time, when we think about diversity, we think about images of, of humans, we think about interactions with humans, and rarely uh, am I in conversations, quite frankly, where we're dealing with the fact that machines are not only replacing people and humans, but machines are also programmed uh, in a way that perhaps isn't going to move us forward as it relates to diversity. So first, let's talk about bias. On the next slide, uh, I want you to just think about this uh, video. Um, so I'm gonna show you a video that illustrates that we all have bias. It's only two minutes, so I wanna watch this video and then I wanna ask you to think about a few things. So we'll watch this video very quickly. We aren't getting any sound. So you aren't getting any sound, but you can get the effect of it uh, just from the reactions. Um, thanks. I show this video not because I want to encourage you to drink beer, but what I want to encourage you to think about is two things. First, how many of you would have walked into the movie theater and stayed there? Now, I know that I can't see everyone's uh, reaction, but I I'd like you to think about the fact that I see two hands raised, another hand raised. All right, and how many people would have walked into the movie theater and been like many of them and actually left? So let me see some hands. All right, I see four people uh, raised their hands and said I would have left. So let, let me uh, talk about how I think this plays out uh, as it relates to bias. 
First of all, if you did not raise your hand because you walked into the movie theater, uh, you have some thoughts about uh, why you would have stayed and you also have some thoughts about why you would have left. So first let's talk about uh, the bias uh, that may have influenced the, way, the reason you would have, or the thoughts that may have influenced why you would have stayed. First, if you walk into a movie theater and you see people who are unfamiliar to you, it's very easy to walk into that space and say, hey, not for me, and then decide to leave. But if you walk into that space and you see people who perhaps don't make you uncomfortable, surely you hit that corner, you go and you find your two seats, not expecting a beer, uh, but because a couple of reasons why we know people have stayed, uh, at least in the responses uh, from other people who have uh, responded to this question. Uh, one is I stay because I pay for the ticket. Two, I stay because quite frankly, they're the best seats in the house. Three, I stayed because um, honestly, I didn't feel any discomfort about it other than I didn't wanna have to crawl over every, all the people. And the presence of 148 bad boys didn't actually have an opinion or effect on me. Now, the reasons why people left. One is, I left because when I turned that corner, it didn't look safe. Two, I left because when I hit that corner and I saw them all, I figured based on who I was with, maybe I should leave. Uh, and three is, quite frankly, when I turn that corner, it's just not what I bargained for. And maybe for the same reasons other people stayed because of those two seats, I chose those aren't the two seats that I would prefer. But whatever it is, I will tell you that if it wasn't this 148, there is 148 people for each one of us that if you turn that corner and you saw 148 of whatever that group is, that you would have had the trigger reaction to say, just like many people in the video, turned around and left. Now, I can tell you uh, that we all have bias. And I will tell you that if I was going to see a movie and I turned the corner, honestly, and there were 148 six-year-olds in the movie that I was about to watch, I probably would turn the corner and come back a little bit later too. Now, it doesn't mean that I have anything against the six-year-olds. It's just that perhaps that's just not the experience I was expecting during that movie. Now, I'm using that in a lighthearted example, but I can tell you that everyone has 148 of somebody that if you turn that corner, I don't know whether for you it is somebody who is of a religious faith, someone who is younger, someone who is older, someone who is ethnically different, someone who's racially different, or someone who has some visible difference that when you that room and you see 148 of them and there's only two seats left that you're willing to actually sit in that space. So this is the challenge that I have for you about bias. The first is if you are one of the 148, no matter where it is, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in your own family, and you have two new people who enter into that same space who are either like you or unlike you, two new people who perhaps are unfamiliar, Imagine the feeling that they may have, and just think about this video as an example. And what is the thing that you feel accountable and responsible to do, besides obviously have a Carlsberg beer, which I don't actually drink beer, but it's a great video. Um, what are the two things, <clears throat> the two or three things that you can do so that when those two people turn that corner and you are one of the 148, that you do your part to ensure that they don't feel excluded? And that whatever it is that you do might help to eliminate the bias, perhaps, that they may have about the group that you have are a part of. And the same way, if you happen to be the two who walk into the room and there's 148 people who are not like you, what are the two, two or three things that you can do so that they can actually make you feel comfortable? Sometimes it requires us to both ask what it is that we can do and the second is that sometimes we have to tell. So if you're one of the 148, I would say if you don't know what to do to make people feel comfortable, ask. And if you're also one of the two walking into the 148, it's also important to tell. Now I use this as an example, we can go to the next slide, is because if we all have bias and we all have to recognize we all have bias, everyone has bias of some kind. And, and it can range from economic bias to a geographic bias, and sometimes bias doesn't necessarily have to be bad, it just is a sign of a lack of understanding about another. People,
who program machines and code also have bias. And without us having a shared commitment to ensure that diversity is not just embedded in workplaces and culture, but that it's also embedded in the programming, we will end up in a situation that quite frankly could exacerbate all the progress that those who've been working in workplaces and culture, um, it could exacerbate it in a way that actually sets us back versus moving us forward. Because people, and I'll emphasize this, people who program machines also have bias. So if we acknowledge that bias exists from the previous conversation slide, then we also have to acknowledge that that bias sometimes unintentionally can easily be programmed into machines uh, and code uh, because of our bias. All right, on the next slide, is this a little cartoon? Um, this cartoon I borrowed from one of my friends who's an engineer, and it says, this is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. Well, what if the answers are wrong? Well, just stir up the pile until they start looking right. Now, I know this is kind of a joke, but sadly, the reality is, is that we are pouring data into a pile, which creates this algorithm. And if the algorithm is fed bad data, you're gonna get bad out. Anyone who is concerned about AI can find on any given day, I'll highlight a couple of algorithms that have produced negative outcomes, particularly related to people of color and often African-Americans. On the next slide, you see a couple of examples. Uh, and whether it's research that highlights that gender and skin type uh, bias exist, uh, there are all kinds of examples. If you Google this, I don't want to have to elaborate on this, but um, uh, with all just this, the time that we have together. But if you if you Google uh, biased data, biased uh, uh, bias in AI, you will find all kinds of stories that highlight uh, examples of where things. Uh, have gone wrong because of bad data sets. These examples, uh, the first one, as I just mentioned about skin, but the second is uh, recruiting. As I mentioned to you, um, data, I mean, uh, diversity on one side is culture and workforce, and on the other side is artificial intelligence. So if in fact, we are beginning to move towards replacing workplace and culture, uh, processes and tools with artificial intelligence, this is what you end up with, unfortunately, when a recruiting tool that shows bias against women replaces the recruiter. Now, we also have to acknowledge that all recruiters, I would imagine, have the best intention of being inclusive in their processes. But if they're replaced with a recruiting tool that actually is programmed with the bias that humans have in the recruiting process, then it is like the example that I show. It's like the accelerated train because rather than a recruiter affecting one person or multiple recruiting cycles, the algorithm can affect thousands of recruiting cycles in the same amount of time. In addition to that, that recruiting tool is not then just being used in one organization. The reason it's exacerbated because it can be used in that organization in an incorrect, and biased way. And at the same time, it can also be used in thousands of other organizations at the same time. So when I earlier mentioned that the context of doing diversity and inclusion uh, inside of a workplace is like the slow train, because it is slow because you're doing one process, one department, one division at a time. AI replacing humans to do that same process could exacerbate and of, of course affect thousands. Uh, the same, another quick example, uh, just to emphasize that this is not then just about sort of human resources. This can affect the way, for example, that you apply for a credit card. Uh, if you all uh, applied for the Apple card, you may have heard of this. Uh, and if you didn't, you may have read about it. Uh, but the bias was that the Apple card, unfortunately for a woman and a, uh, for male and female identified, uh, they, actually gave more credit to the male than they gave to the female with similar credit scores, income, and literally the same kind of information provided. So 
if we're allowing, for example, rather than a human in the past, this would be a human decision, like you get a yes and you get a no. Now we're talking about it affecting multiple people at the same time. And this last example, I'm sure anybody and everyone has experienced this in the airport, uh, they've experienced it in any place that they've gone where you put your hand under the soap. And quite frankly, you wonder why the soap isn't coming out if you have brown hands. A part of it is, is because the data sets that were used to create this product did not include data sets of brown hands. So these are simple examples. You can find many more on your own, but I will tell you the point that I want to highlight is like the future is AI. The decisions we make today to either include diversity in AI will affect us, not just today, but exacerbate the future. So I'm all about making sure every conversation includes, every diversity conversation includes AI and every AI conversation includes diversity. All right, on the next slide. All right, so it's not just the programmers that machines learn from. We all provide data. Uh, I think sometimes when uh, I talk about this, even with my own family being, you know, my nieces and nephews and my parents, because this is a conversation that I have with people all the time, is that sometimes people think it's somebody else doing this, that somebody else is doing the programming that has bias. What I can tell you is we're all contributing to machine learning every day in just the uses of everyday products and tools. And I, on the next slide, I'll give you a couple of examples. So my family uh, might, for example, be in a photo. Let's just use Facebook as an example. So my family is in a photo. Um, I remember when I first started using Facebook, I actually would have to tag people in a photo. Machine learning has advanced so much on Facebook that even if I don't even remember taking the picture and if I wasn't there, that Facebook will ask me, is this you? So think about that switch. There was a time when you had to tag people in order for them to be associated with a photo. Well, because of facial recognition technology, today when I log on to Facebook, it'll ask me, is this you? And by the way, that is because of machine learning. Now you may already know this, but then every time I say yes, what it does is it validates the framing of my own face. So now going forward, what ends up happening is that when I go on, when I log in, it has a better chance of that actually. When it asks me, is this you? the more that I validate it myself by programming the computer, I mean, programming the uh, Facebook technology to do this, it actually is saying, yeah, hey, that's candy. Google Photos, another example. My sister um, is not a person who uh, likes to use uh, any kind of social media. So the reality is, if you Google my sister, you will likely not find her listed in images. You will not find her listed on uh, Facebook, you will not find her listed on IG, you won't find her on Snap, you won't find her anywhere. However, I take a lot of photos. I take more photos than you probably can imagine. In this moment, if I pulled up photos, it would tell you that I have approximately 64,000 pictures on my phone. In fact, 63,986 photos. Yes, I do have that on my phone on this one little Apple iPhone, right? Uh, 11 to be clear. Now, why am I bringing that up as an example? Is because I have that many photos, then I also have to back my photos up because at some point my iPhone is gonna say, if you add one more photo, I'm gonna stop working for you. Um, so I back up my photos both on the cloud, on Apple, and I also black up, back up my photo, photos on Google Photos. Now. That itself, backing it up, is not the problem. The opportunity comes, <coughs> excuse me, because in back, uh, uploading my photos to Google, the same sister who doesn't have any information out in the world, one day I log on to Google to check my photos, looking for a photo, and it showed me a picture of my sister today 
and showed me a picture of my sister when she was 12. Now, I have a choice in that moment, even though my sister doesn't even know I'm doing this, I can say yes, and what I'm doing is the same way that Facebook has facial recognition, and I'm volunteering to say, yes, this is me. Google Photos is actually now allowing me to help identify somebody who doesn't even know I'm helping them to identify. So she doesn't even know. If I say yes, and the more times I say yes, that no matter where she is, where Google facial recognition technology is used, they can validate that this is actually my sister. Well, they won't say it's my sister. I'm saying that they can actually validate that this is who the person is. So every time you say yes to that validation, because it likes to sort of group your photos and say, here's all the photos of you. Here's all the photos of your mother. Here's all the photos of your friend named Jane, right? Or Jania, whatever your friend is, right? So every time we think about how we validate this, we are actually becoming programmers ourselves. We aren't programming literally the code, but we are also programming machine learning. Now I could give you several examples. I'll just give you one more. So if you have a phone, I'd like you to pull it out and I'd like you to Google the word cute babies. Cute babies. So pull out your phone and Google cute babies. All right, so when you Google cute babies and go to images, so I just can scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. Now, I see one now that actually is a brown person. Now, I don't know the actual demographic, but I can tell you that there, a lot of work has gone into ensuring that when you search cute babies that you actually see babies of other demographics. So when we like a photo of a cute baby, we, we ourselves are also telling Google, oh, this is a cute baby. So when you think about sort of the history of cute babies, there is all kinds of other examples about a doll. You can take two dolls, a black doll and a white doll. And when you ask people which doll is pretty, the doll that people give the most likes to is the white doll. That same thinking has also now gone into programming, literally an algorithm so that when you search cute babies, uh, when you search uh, college students, all of these kinds of things. So when you hear people complaining, frustrated, angry in workplaces in the streets, it's because for many years we have known this. And in many years, people have not paid attention to it nor in workplaces, nor in algorithms. So I can give you more examples, but I won't. I will just tell you that as you think about when you are programming uh, or uh, responding to a survey, playing a game, all of those things tell people who you are, and they're also providing feedback so that the machine gets to learn more about you. Now, I can, I'm gonna give you one other example. I was, I literally bought a ring I bought two rings. Actually, I bought three rings. This is really bad, really bad. Uh, but it's a true example. Uh, I bought three rings while I was traveling. And I bought it from a distributor that actually is still a distributor also in the US. And the distributor in the US, uh, I have no idea how this happened, but I opened up my phone. And I am not kidding you. It is not by sheer coincidence that the advertisement that I saw on my phone on the Google search included those three rings, those exact same three rings. It is not any coincidence that when you search for something in Google, that when you go to another app that you actually see that same product that you just searched for, it is machine learning. It is the way of the future. It is not going away. Just be mindful. All right, that's all the examples I'm gonna give on that. On the next slide. Um, I see a question uh, about, uh, you know, do we have rights to privacy around uh, our images and have consent? Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, but I will tell you that there are all kinds of, there is a, uh, actually, I'll just tell you this now. If you've not watched uh, The Great Hack uh, available on Netflix, um, you will see that this whole conversation about privacy is evolving. 
Because sometimes once you put things out into the internet uh, universe, uh, you do lose, unfortunately, the control over it. Uh, it is also said uh, that uh, Facebook has more than 5,000 data points about people. 5,000 data points. By the way, these are data points that sometimes we didn't even think about. We're playing a game. We tell them what our favorite color is. We tell them who our best friends are. All of these things are actually um, pro providing Facebook or any kind of uh, technology information about us. The information that is being shared about us may not be as bad as until it's combined, and I'm going to come back to that. So for the purpose of uh, AI, it can be used for good. Right. So in the same way that I'd be concerned uh, about sort of us programming and my sister now, all of a sudden her face is recognizable at any age because of something I've done in selecting. Yes. Every time Google says, is this her? Is this her? And I say yes. I also think <clears throat> AI can be used for good. So on the next slide um, are a couple of uh, examples. So if, if you do like shopping in the same way, that you know, I use as an example, oh my goodness, I bought these three rings and now uh, somehow Google knows about it and they're advertising. Uh, it could also help you if you're looking for something. So imagine that you went to search for a thing and whatever that thing was, you didn't have time to actually buy it at that moment. Automation, uh, as well as the machine having learned what you have an interest in, sometimes you might get the better deal. You might actually find out what the competition has to offer. So it doesn't always have to be that it's a surprise to you that you saw these three rings. But imagine that I had an interest in rings with butterflies. By the way, this is my butterfly ring. And the reason that I know that that ad was targeted at me based on all the rings I bought had butterflies. I bought these butterfly rings where, where, when I travel. Don't ask me. It's kind of one of my weird things. Anyway. Um, Google Suite, um, uh, it can also be used if you don't like putting the same information in uh, over and over and over again. Uh, it can be used for good because if you are, uh, don't want to have to program every single time you get in, I think that there is a generation uh, that uses Google Suite as probably their primary mode of uh, processing information and whether that's sharing through a presentation like this or whether that is sharing or submitting a paper for school, um, Google Suites uh, actually can be used for good if in fact it is protected in a way that the question that was asked earlier about privacy. Um, storing data is another way that it could be used for good. So that if you're going into, uh, and I don't mean good in the world, I mean good for you, not good in the world. Uh, I have to say that sometimes like trying to remember every single password that I have, um, it, can and sometimes you know they want like a capital they want like uh, a letter they want a symbol they want one capital letter and lowercase letters and then sometimes they actually won't allow you to use a symbol so it's sometimes hard to remember all of these things i would tell you that there's all kinds of safe technology that allows you to store your passwords uh one password is something that we use uh, at twitter it's actually something i use personally but i i think that uh, as we move forward in the future, everything is going to require a password. Everything is going to require two-factor authentication. If you're not using two-factor authentication already right now, I would suggest if you take nothing away from this conversation, that you do that. You do that so that if someone hacks your account, by the way, somebody tried to get into my Gmail today and I got a note because I have two-factor authentication, they have my password. This is a real thing. They have my password, but because I have two-factor authentication, they actually can't get into it. And now I can go into Google and change my password. Uh, automation uh, that recognizes uh, that we are all different and that these are, this is information we're providing to them um, and providing it back into the world uh, in a way that isn't used uh, in a racially or uh, that, that doesn't uh, impact uh, gender or gender identity uh, in a way that is harmful. Uh, I would say that this is another emphasis on any of these things that we're using, ensuring that whoever is doing the programming uh, is also conscious of the fact that sometimes these things might not be what they intend. As an example, I'll use a target example. I have a friend uh, who had a child, uh, a, a child when she was in her 30s, and she had a child when she was in her 40s. 
Now, the algorithm has somehow been programmed with ages. So when she started doing her Google search for information about products for babies, remember the ones I told you that might be helpful in this case? The algorithm said, if you are searching for a product at this age, and somehow they got her age, that you must be a grandmother. So instead of them saying congratulations or sending her information related to having a child as a mother, they started sending her information and targeted ads related to being a grandmother. Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone who's in the background, who is a programmer said, if they are asking for baby information between these ages, intentionally said, if you're over 40, you must be a grandmother. But someone programmed it in that way because she started receiving multiple ads related to her age demographic. So someplace she had told someone her age. They combined that information and targeted her for an ad for things that she searched for for babies. They combined that with her age and now she's getting information that by the way, is not actually making her want to buy. In fact, it actually made her never want to buy from an organization that's targeting her in that way. So, Sometimes it doesn't work out in the way that it is planned. On the next slide, it highlights that sometimes AI cannot be so good. In this example that I just gave, it's just not intentional, uh, but somebody put an age parameter around that. And by the way, this person uh, who I'm using as an example was so frustrated with receiving ads in that way that she decided she was never going to buy that product. On the next slide are another couple of examples. So targeted ads I already talked about. Now, um, I don't know how many of you uh, watch uh, Black Mirror, uh, but if you have not uh, watched Black Mirror, it's also on uh, Netflix. Uh, it tells a story about how people uh, can get obsessed with scores uh, related to um, things like uh, technology uh, apps. So. Uh, without sort of unveiling the entire story uh, on, on Black Mirror, and I'm going to come back to it, why I've added China, because I want you to Google Black Mirror China. So I've given you a couple of assignments, right? So this is another one of those things. So I told you to do these Google searches. They will highlight the absence of diversity in programming. I've also highlighted that these ads um, often are targeted by a demographic. Uh, at a demographic based on information you've provided combined with a data set that the organization has said, if this person equals this, then send them this. Sometimes it's not so well. This is all automated. Uh, Black Mirror, this episode uh, on Black Mirror uh, was talking specifically about a rating. Now, the rating is similar to uh, Uber. So uh, when you get in an Uber or a Lyft, you give uh, and you get out, you give them a score, and they give you a score. But imagine that that score impacted your ability to access a thing. And whether that is access housing, uh, access, uh, go into a club or a store. So this app actually was an experiment uh, when it was the real life. I mean, obviously, this is a, a television episode. But the, the person uh, that's featured is trying to improve her rating. And the purpose of improving her rating was because there was a place she wanted to live that her rating had to be of a certain level in order for her to live in this building. She had to raise her, um, she had to raise her score by a certain number of points. She hired a specialist who actually was focused on helping her to do that. And the reason I bring it up is not because it was a, an episode on Black Mirror. The reason I bring it up is because Black Mirror actually happened in China as a pilot. So Google Black Mirror China, uh, and you will see that if we move to a place, right, where I can give you a score, you can give me a score, and we have bias, imagine then how that could affect our interactions and our access to things in the world. So I'm really hoping this never comes to pass as a real situation beyond this example that's happening in China, but this is actually real. So imagine if you have any bias towards a particular demographic, age, gender, gender identity, people with various abilities, um, and, and you get to rate me, and that then affects my ability to do a thing in the world, how disastrous that could be. But 
This is the future. So we should all, yeah, it is frightening, Tanya. It is frightening, but it is real. All right. Uh, I talked a little bit about targeted propaganda. And the, and the other thing that I told you to watch is the episode uh, on um, Netflix called The Great Hack. The Great Hack talks about the, the way that targeted propaganda can influence you as a human on social media. This is the big debate that you might hear people talking about today, uh, which is why on any uh, channel that you turn to and you see any th conversations that are happening on social media, I will not uh, name any particular organizations. Uh, what I would suggest to you is that the concern that people have is the fact that uh, if we don't have processes and policies inside of organizations that prevent uh, inappropriate uh, misinformation, uh, false information targeted at a particular demographic group, that it can actually influence behavior. And it, as it did, is highlighted in this documentary called The Great Hack. The Great Hack uh, highlights uh, the, the evidence of data privacy violations and how targeted information uh, influenced the 2016 election in America, as well as many other elections around the world, and how it's influencing society in ways that it is subliminal and we aren't even aware of it. Uh, because uh, uh, of time, I won't elaborate other than to suggest to you that, that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning used in a negative way can change society in a way that, that we can't turn away from. And not only can we not turn away from, but it, but it unfortunately can influence how decisions are made in ways that we won't be able to undo, like an election. All right, next slide. So uh, as I started, every diversity conversation should include AI and every AI conversation should include diversity. All right, next slide. I think that might be it. So now what I'm gonna do is open this up for questions. So um, Tanya said, it sounds like Westworld. It absolutely does sound like Westworld. I do think that um, as you watch Congress uh, debate and have conversations around privacy, it will be the next I would say if it's not on your priority list to be mindful of, particularly if you are a girl in tech or if you are in tech and not talking about this, this is something that everyone needs to have on their tongue and have a commitment to ensuring that if diversity is not a part of this conversation, that you are changing the future literally by every decision, every program, every code, every algorithm, if we're not being mindful of the way that bias um, can influence all of the things that we do every day. I wish that I could tell you that humans are not biased. I wish that I could tell you that, and by the way, I wish that I could tell you that people are doing this intentionally because they're not. I would tell you, I, I know lots of engineers. Uh, I have friends who are engineers. I, was, I work with engineers. I was trained by Berkeley by engineers. But what I can tell you is, is that at no part of this conversation uh, was there a cultural element that says, consider this. So if we believe that there is pay equity as an example in the world, we should also know that people aren't necessarily sitting in a room saying, hey, let's ensure that women never get equal pay. But it is the bias that we have that has allowed that to happen. And that same bias will creep into processes that we're all involved in every single day. So. Uh, I will uh, ask uh, if there are any questions before we wrap up. Uh, let's see. All right. It says, if we don't know how to code, how, we, how can we get into AI? I, I would say during this particular moment, there are uh, a number of online uh, classes like one-on-one. -on -one uh, 101 basics to AI. Many organizations are offering these classes for free. I can tell you, you can watch YouTube videos that, that explain AI and the basics. Uh, you don't have to be an AI uh, expert to be concerned about it, and you don't have to be an AI expert to ensure that everything that you're working with uh, 
includes some element of diversity. Uh, what I can also tell you is that there's enough experts in the world, uh, a lot of work being done by Stanford. Uh, they actually have uh, an AI uh, council, which is focused on ensuring that there is fairness in AI, that there's equity in AI. Uh, and many organizations are leaning into having equity uh, and ethics officers that are focused on this, particularly in software. Uh, what percentage of your uh, machine learning algorithm uh, should be supervised versus unsupervised? Actually, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I would say is that um, having a, a committee uh, inside of your organization that actually sets some standards for how your organization uh, will operate uh, and by the way, having some audits associated with that, I would say, um, I don't know if there is a, a, an actual a percentage that I would recommend. Um, I, I think the first place to start is to one, make sure your organization is having the conversation and two, identifying who in your organization is responsible for making that decision for your specific org. Um, are there any campaigns we can be a part of to ensure that diversity and programming of AI or are there things we can do day to day uh, on a day to day basis to diversify? Uh, so I think the first thing I would say is it's really important uh, for us to uh, just advocate for it in the same way that we advocate for uh, recycling, uh, that same way that we advocate for uh, diversity, the same way that we advocate hopefully for uh, gender inclusion and pay equity. Um, there are a number of uh, efforts right now to try to think about how we aggregate uh, in this into a campaign, uh, but there are individual organizations that are focused on it. Uh, Twitter actually has a program called Meta, um, which is uh, a gentleman uh, named uh, Luca. I would, Luca is like the coolest dude I, I know, uh, and he is uh, one of those voices that when I, um, am struggling or frustrated about how to approach uh, this uh, either inside of our organization or outside of our organization. Uh, he's just a great voice of reason. Uh, I would say make a friend uh, in the space so that uh, in the same way that you think about diversifying your relationships and making sure that you're living an intersectional life, I would say make sure that you have uh, someone in your life uh, as a part of your regular conversations that make this a part of not just a webinar and not just a class, but, but that this becomes a part of your, art, uh, your language. All right, so what about ensuring that diverse set of AI programmers make up every team? Of course, um, what I can say <laughs> is um, some people say uh, we can't find any related specifically just to diverse candidates in general. What I would say is what we significantly have an opportunity to stop saying that because I have attended Grace Hopper for probably the last 10 years. What I can tell you is there is not a lack of women in engineering. There's a lack of them being employed in engineering. Uh, what I can tell you, having attended Nesby and SHIP, Nesby and SHIP and supported those organizations, there's not a lack of Black or Latinx uh, engineers. There's a lack of them being employed. So in the same way, uh, in order for us to address the question about how do we not ensure that there is a, set, uh, uh, a diverse set of AI programmers, we have to have that, we have to first improve the diversity of the software team, and second, making sure that the AI programmers are a part of that software team, and we need to stop saying that we can't find them because that actually is not a true statement. Um, do you have a recommended resources to learn? Um, there is a book called uh, um, The Algorithms. Oh, man, of course my brain is drawing a blank on it. It's called The uh, Algorithms of, it's gonna come back to me. No, I, 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 and if, I, if it doesn't come back to me, what I'll do is hopefully uh, Girls in Tech has the attendee list and we'll send out a couple of recommended uh, algorithms of oppression. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Thank you, uh, Tazen. Uh, that, that's a great book. Uh, it's actually um, uh, 
a book that we have provided to a number of people outside. Uh, when I have friends who ask about it, it gives all kinds of great examples, more significantly more details than the examples that I gave. I tried recognizing that there is lots of generational uh, differences in the people who might join this call as well as the level of experience. So I tried to be a little bit uh, more basic, actually basic, uh, is the way that we should begin to talk about this because if we try to make this feel so scientific I think that people will feel like oh, I don't feel comfortable having that conversation and we just need to make this a part of our language um, the uh, let's see yes she is the bomb written by a black woman she is a genius and she just dropped another article today uh, that is also about uh, Professor Noble out of UCLA. All right, uh, leadership in companies should be implementing these diversity policies in their software development uh, and AI uh, development teams. So I'm gonna tell you, I've been doing uh, IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. So IDEA, I've been doing IDEA, uh, work for 15 years. And what I can tell you is the amount of effort that it has taken for us to embed diversity into HR practices uh, is still, in some cases, still like moving on the slow train. Um, the, the work expanding outside of HR into marketing, product development, and customer, into customer service is still literally not happening in many organizations. So when you talk about adding it to software development, AI development, absolutely a necessity. Um, but unfortunately, the same resistance that we got to HR and customers and, and marketing is the same kind of resistance, unfortunately, that still exists uh, in the engineering organizations as well. So this has to be uh, not just uh, championed by one or two people in an organization. It has to be uh, leader led and it also has to be grassroots. So in addition to that, it has to be a part of the way that we think about, even the way we think about uh, this in universities, the way we think about it in grade school, the way we think about it in, in uh, new higher orientation, it needs to be a part of every single thing we do. So this is my big vision in the world. Um, obviously doing uh, idea work every day, uh, this is uh, one way, right, is volunteering to get no, new, you know, new 43 new people to think about this in a way that perhaps they hadn't before. Um, and more importantly, as I said, to make this a part of every conversation so that it isn't sort of uh, some abstract or some technical thing that makes people feel uncomfortable having it. Just think uh, about a time when uh, you realize that something you've done has influenced the way that a machine operates or the way an app, app operates. And, and, and now that I've brought this to your attention, you're going to see this in something you're gonna do and you're gonna go, oh my goodness, I just did this. That's the kind of example that you wanna start using. So start using own your own personal examples so that it isn't sort of this abstract thing that perhaps a person who's not a programmer, uh, a person who's not a coder, a person who's not an engineer, a person who perhaps doesn't work in tech can understand the importance of it so that it can be a part of everyday conversations. All right, the last question is, women uh, usually learn new things and skills, but they need opportunities to encourage them to enter the field and receive uh, support to feel comfortable. And by the way, you've come to the right place. You've come to Girls in Tech today, and that is exactly what we exist to do, is to ensure that women and girls think about ways to learn new skills. Um, and today was just one example, I think, of all the things that Girls in Tech is trying to do to elevate this kind of conversation. If we are not not talking about bias and artificial intelligence and diversity and AI, we are missing the mark at Girls in Tech. We are missing the mark in education. We are missing the mark in workplaces. And we're missing the mark in the way that we build products and services. Products and services will replace, eventually be replaced in many cases by machine learning. And all of us have a role to play in ensuring that the outcomes are not ones that make us have to have some kind of rally or some kind of um, campaign because we didn't get it right. Um, 
this is already happening. And what I'm going to tell you is that we're all playing a part in it. And I am here to try to remind you that you play an important part in ensuring that we spread the word. I wanna thank you all for your time today. Uh, I know that uh, this is the beginning of many conversations. Uh, I, I imagine that Girls in Tech uh, might offer even an AI 101 session that might be helpful for you to at least understand it uh, beyond what we just talked today. Uh, and I also think that uh, we, all, we all have the ability to hold each other accountable. So when you see something uh, that is the result of a decision that was made by a machine, call it out. That's, what's, that's what social media is about. Make it a part of your conversation. Make yourself a champion to ensure that diversity is included in every AI conversation. We have been given each day to use as we will. We can waste it or use it for good. When tomorrow comes, this day, this time will be gone forever. And in its place are the decisions and the actions that we left behind. May the actions and decisions we make after this always make us mindful that diversity in AI and AI in diversity is an important conversation and it should be one that we are having just like we talk about environmental, just like we talk about diversity in workplaces and pay equity. Let's add this to the list of things that we're concerned about. Thank you and have a wonderful day, evening, uh, wherever you are. And on behalf of Girls in Tech, be safe. Thanks.